Thank you, guys. Yeah, no, I we came here. Me and uh, my parents felt a call to come here, going into my eighth grade year, and uh, it was probably two and a half months before I was playing drums a little bit, because um, I like playing drums. Drums are my thing. Music's my thing. I thought I was gonna go to college for music. God didn't though. Um, and yeah, he did. And um, but I always told myself I'd, if I was ever on a stage, I would always be behind a drum set. Um, and God, God didn't, God didn't think that either. Um, and so being sensitive to him and what he's saying to me, um, here I am. And so uh, I'm glad I'm here. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that y'all are here. Uh, and hopefully y'all won't be throwing tomatoes by the end of this. This is, this is going to be tough to listen to. There are going to be some parts of this, and this is just a disclaimer forewarning. There's going to be some parts of this message that hopefully won't step on any personal toes, but might make some people uncomfortable. Um, and, and that's good. Discomfort's good. I don't know if anybody knows what growing pains are, uh, but you hardly grow without growing pains. Um, and so we, we hardly grow in comfortable places. So I hope I can make you all a little uncomfortable today. Um, if uh, I, don't, I don't put scripture on the screen normally, but the scripture we're going to be out of is Isaiah 53. Um, and so if you have Bible apps, anything, um, I'll be out of HCSB. Um, so if you're in a Bible app, you can do that, or, or you can read out of whatever Bible you prefer. So Isaiah 53. Um, this is the suffering servant. This is a messianic prophecy. This is Isaiah prophesying a word from God about Jesus. Um, spoiler alert, the suffering servant is Jesus. Um, so let's, let's just read it. And if y'all would, um, I'd like for y'all to stand. Uh, this is just something I like uh, in some of my classes. One of my classes, we're going through the book of Hebrews, and we read through the entire book of Hebrews, that's 13 chapters, also 50 minutes of reading, uh, standing up. He made us stand up while we read it, and it's a four-hour class, and he take, takes up all four hours. So um, this is just one chapter, though. I'm not going to make y'all stand up for the whole message, so rest assured. Uh, so just read along with me. Who has believed what we have heard, and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground, he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself, everybody say yet. Yet, yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. And we, in turn, regarded him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the, iniqui the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of, his, or because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death, although he had done no violence. He had not spoken deceitfully. Yet, Everybody say, yet. yet. The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a restitution or a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see it out of his anguish, and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant, Jesus, will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as a spoil because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Y'all pray with me. God, you're holy and amazing and wonderful. 
Your ways are higher than our ways. We can't understand you. God, I want to take this time um, on the congregation's behalf just to just to worship you and, and, and tell you who you are and how awesome you are and how worthy of all the glory you are. Let everything we do in this service and in our lives outside of this service be to glorify you. Give me the words to speak and let, let them hear it, how your spirit would will. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can sit down. So we talk about Easter and the resurrection and, and these happy things, Jesus raising from the dead, but how did he get there? And why did he get there? We're talking about the crucifixion today, uh, the suffering servant. How did he suffer? He was rejected um, and he was crucified. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. Um, that's what I think. So the first point of it, the first three verses tell us that he was rejected and despised. It actually says he was despised twice. If the Bible repeats anything in the same little passage, it's important. Take note of it. Highlight it. Write it down. Whatever you have to do. The first three verses um, says, Who has believed what we have heard, and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was, and he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised second time, and we didn't value him. This is the rejection of the Messiah, of the suffering servant. Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be despised, would be rejected by men. We know that when Jesus came here, people didn't like what Jesus was about. They're following laws uh, in Judaism that, that are pointing to him, right? There, it's the shadow of, G, of the Messiah to come, of Jesus. Yet when the person who the shadow is cast off of comes, they can't see it. They despise him. They reject him, and they miss it totally. It goes right over their head. The servant didn't have an impressive form. Um, I've heard uh, people say that because, uh, let's see exactly what it says. Um, he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. I've heard people say that that means Jesus was ugly. Maybe so. But the, the point of it is he wasn't impressive. He was nothing special to the eye. He was just like you and me. Um, especially maybe me. Some of y'all, some of y'all are spe more special looking, than, more, y'all more good looking than I am. But, um, but definitely me. So, but he was despised and rejected based off of how people saw him, right? So, um, I just want to get some. I, I, I like to add in some other scripture just to validate what this is saying. We we read the Bible in perspective, certain scriptures in the perspective of the rest of the Bible. Uh, we know that none of the Bible contradicts, so we can do some scripture that validates. Uh, Psalm 22, 6 says, uh, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. Psalm is full of prophecy um, that people just look right over. Um, he's a worm despised by men. A worm. <laughs> Rejection of the Messiah. Um, I, I, I try to think of different things that I reject just by how they look. Um, sometimes it can be um, neighborhoods. We, we might not want to drive through certain neighborhoods or we'll make sure our doors are locked driving through certain neighborhoods. Um, we, we might see certain people that we don't really like just because of how they look and we'll walk right past them. But we don't know that, uh, or we don't realize that God put them here just like he put you here the same way. And it'll take you out the same way. Um, we can relate on that instance, but we look at certain things and we judge them. Um, I'm part of the BSU lead team at William Carey right now. Um, going into this next year, I'll be the vice president of the BSU. 
and we do meetings on Wednesday mornings at 6.45 a.m. in the morning. Because classes start at 8, and every, we've got 14 people. We're trying to hash out the schedules, so we just meet early in the morning. I didn't make it up, but whatever. Um, <laughs> vice president doesn't get that much say. But. So, but the president, uh, her name is Savannah Socher. Um, she makes breakfast for us in the morning, and she texted in the group chat for the breakfast thing. This is getting somewhere, y'all. Just hang with me. She texted in the group chat, do y'all want blueberry muffins for breakfast or cinnamon roll cake? One of the best things you can put in front of me in the morning is a cinnamon roll. I love a good, I mean, it's not bacon, but it's a cinnamon roll. I mean, I, I, love, I love a cinnamon roll. So I'm ex- I said cinnamon roll cake because I'm expecting this to be a big sheet with some cinnamon rolls all lined up, and we can cut them into squares, you know, if we call it a cake, and we can cut it into squares or something and put it there, put our glaze over it and stuff, and, and just eat that. So I got to this meeting in the morning, and I can be a morning person if I want to, but just don't do me wrong in the morning, you know? I mean, and they did me wrong. They did me wrong, Miss Bev. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a cinnamon roll cake. It was a cinnamon cake. Which is fine. That's fine. That's, but that's, not brec- that's not breakfast, and it's not a cinnamon roll. I still ate it. Um, because, because I didn't want to offend anybody, but uh, I myself was offended. Um. And, and so that was something I wanted to reject based on it off of its appearance. I didn't, and I, it wasn't for any moral reason that I didn't, except for the fact that it was morning, I was hungry. But, um, so, but the, the point of this is the Jews in that day, and the Gentiles didn't know one way or the other, but the Jews in that day rejected the Messiah that came. Jesus Christ came, and he was rejected. Will we do the same when he's revealed to us? Who has believed what we have heard? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? Now, I haven't gone into major exegetical, theological, hermeneutical, homiletical study on who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to. I didn't really think it was super necessary to. Maybe I was wrong. But that makes me think of the two guys after Jesus resurrected Makes me think of that whenever they're on this seven mile journey and Jesus breaks bread with them. And, and when, they, when he breaks bread with them, they realize, oh snap, this is Jesus. And I'm, I'm convinced that they only realized that because they, he broke bread and they saw his arms. They saw that he had scars. Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? This is Isaiah. This is hundreds of years before Jesus. Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? And will we reject it when it is? Let's move on, because it got quiet. This is a, a, a joke about the exegetical, theological, hermeneutical, homiletical study and stuff, but this is kind of one of those words. Um, and it only gets worse from here, so y'all just hang on. Um, but the justification by the Messiah. So the next three verses, Isaiah 53 is split up into 12 verses, and it's split up evenly into four little sections. Um, so the next three verses, this is verses four through six. Yet he himself bore our sickness, and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. This is justification. Justification in the simplest way to explain it is, and it's been explained here this way, just as if I'd never sinned. Jesus justifying me is, making me as if I had never sinned. Hebrews tells us that he remembers our sins no more. Thank God. Uh, and not only does he cover our sins, but he takes them away. 
How did he do that? Well, the punishment for our peace was on him. What happened to him on the, on the cross throughout his suffering life was because of our sin. It was what we deserved, but what he took for us. And because of that, he justified us. In that, he justified us. Uh, one way to look at this, I'm a mathematical thinker. Some of y'all might not be. Um, that might have just been fine. Th- that would have been fine for me. I would have need. I would have needed more uh, mathematical explanation. So, Jesus was righteous. Man is sinful. I am sinful. So Jesus is righteous. I'm sinful. Jesus' righteousness went on to me, and my sin went on to him. That's how, that's how it works. It's a trade-off. The, uh, the word for that is penal substitution. That's not, you don't need to know that. Um, but just know that his right, we hold his righteousness, and he became our sin. He who knew no sin became sin. And we'll, we'll get into that more and more. Um, so we deserve punishment. The, the, the Messiah took our place, and many will still regard him as stricken. Many still reject. This Jesus, the suffering servant, came down, died for our punishment that we deserve. We live sinful lives. He came down and took away our sin. And still, people reject him. He gave us the greatest gift, life, eternal, heaven, uh, an allowance to be in the glory of God. And still we regard him stricken, struck down and afflicted by God. Matthew 26, 66 um, says this. Let's see if I can get there. It says... What is your decision? They answered, he deserved death. They said that Jesus deserved death. And truth be told, he did. But it wasn't because he lived a sinful life. It was because he took on our sinful lives. He did deserve death because of what he became. He who knew no sin became sin. I think about, you know, you, you hear stories and read books about different stories of a father and a son, and um, the son just does not clean his room, okay, and, and uh, but he wants to go to this football game on Friday night, and he his dad said, you can't unless you clean your room, unless you get it clean. The boy comes home from school. Um, and he had still not cleaned his room, even after his dad told him that. Had time to, just didn't. And his room was clean. He came home to a clean room, a clean room that he didn't clean. And he asked his dad, "Dad, how I don't I didn't clean my room. I'm I, you know I I don't have to go to the football game because I didn't I didn't clean it." And, and the dad said, well, I, I did. I did for you. I want you to go to the football game. I'm going to go with you. If you believe, if you believe, this is the condition, if you believe, then the Messiah took your place in punishment. He took the place of those who believe. Those who believe are justified by the Messiah. The next point, this is the part where we might get a little uncomfortable. I will. I want y'all to know that. This is something that makes me uncomfortable to think about, to explain. But it gives me hope. That's the crucifixion of the Messiah. Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah 
would be cut off from the land of the living. Let's just read the next three. Um, the next three verses. This is verse uh, verses seven through nine. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was meek. He could have just flicked and killed everybody who was hurting him, but he took it. We, we know that he deserved it because he became our sin. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of, his, because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. Because of sinful man, humanity, corrupted by sin and Jesus, perished because of it. I don't know if y'all are familiar, familiar with apologetics. That's not just people apologizing to a bunch of people and saying I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's people, apologetists are people who go around, normally they travel around and they make defenses for Christianity and the gospel. Um, there's, a, there's one on the internet that, um, on YouTube that his name is Frank Turek and uh, he, he does a pretty good um, apologetics ministry. He wrote an article on the crucifixion and what the crucifixion was really like, really like what it was like scripturally and historically. Um, this is someone who has done more study than I am, so I'm reading his work because he's done more study. He's smarter, and I don't want to misspeak about it. So this is this. Is, uh, he puts a warning. This is graphic. Um, you may have a difficult time getting through it. So. If you get queasy, I'm not going to get offended if you run out. So, the whip the, ro the Roman soldiers use on Jesus has small iron balls and sharp pieces of sheep bones tied to it. Jesus is stripped of his clothing, and his hands are tied to an upright post. His back, buttocks, and legs are whipped either by one soldier or two who alternate positions. The soldiers taunt their victim. As they repeatedly strike Jesus' back with full force, the iron balls cause deep contusions and the sheep bones cut into the skin and tissues. As the whipping continues, the lacerations tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss set the stage for circulatory shock. And Jesus felt this, by the way. As much as he was 100% God, he's 100% man. And, he felt, and Hebrews tells us he felt, all, this is just a little side note, Hebrews tells us he felt full temptation. Every temptation that you have and you satisfy with sin, he felt it and didn't sin. He didn't satisfy temptation. He felt all of it. And so you can live in a way that says Jesus understands what I'm going through because he went through it but he didn't give in to sin thank God because now we can live um, an eternal life because of it when it is determined by the centurion in charge that Jesus is near death the beating is finally stopped the half fainting Jesus is then untied and allowed to slump to the stone pavement Wet with his own blood, the Roman soldiers see a great joke in this provincial Jew claiming to be a king. They throw a robe across his shoulders and place a stick in his hand for a scepter. They still need a crown to make their travesty complete. A small bundle of flexible branches covered with long thorns are plated into the shape of a crown, and this is pressed into his scalp. Again, there is copious bleeding scalp being one of the most vascular areas in the body. After mocking him and striking him across the face, the soldiers take the stick from his hand and strike him across the head, driving the thorns deeper into his scalp. Finally, finally, when they tire of their sadistic sport, the robe is torn from his back. The robe had already become 
adherent to the clots of blood and serum in the wounds and its removal, just as in the careless removal of a surgical bandage, cause excruciating pain, almost as though he were being whipped again. The wounds again, uh, again began to bleed. Indifference, uh, uh, indifference to Jewish custom, the Romans returned his garments. The heavy horizontal beam of the cross is tied across his, across his shoulders, and the procession of the uh, condemned Christ. Two thieves and the execution party walk along the Via Dolorosa. In spite of his efforts to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden beam together with the shock produced by copious blood loss is too much. He stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam gouges into his lacerated skin and muscles of the shoulder. He tries to rise, but human muscles have been pushed beyond their endurance. The centurion, anxious to get on with the crucifixion, selects a stalwart North African onlooker, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross. Jesus follows still bleeding and sweating the, the cold, clammy sweat of shock. It's a 650-yard journey from the fortress of Antonia to uh, Golgotha, and it's finally completed. Jesus is again stripped of his clothes except for a loincloth, which is allowed for Jews. The crucifixion begins. Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh, a mild pain-killing mixture. He refuses to drink the mild pain-killing mix, mixture. <laughs> Simon is ordered to place the cross beam on the ground, and Jesus is quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrists, and he drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tight, but to allow some flexibility and movement. The beam is then lifted, and the title reading, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is nailed in place. The victim Jesus is now crucified as he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in the wrists. Excruciating, fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves, as he pushes himself upward to avoid the stretching torment, he places his full weight on the nails through his feet. Again, there is the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurs. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain with these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. A hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but it cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmatically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. It is undoubtedly during these periods that he utters the, sh the seven short sentences that are recorded. Jesus went through all of that so you and I could be reconciled to him. So that you and I could be saved from our sins. In his, in his last breath, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Tell me this isn't serious. Tell, tell me this isn't a big deal. Tell me what other religion, what other God there is to serve who is willing not only to, it's not just sending his son, it's sending himself. This is God the Son. What religion is worth serving other than the one that saves? <laughs> Let's move on. This is another big word. It's hard to explain. It's, it's in Scripture. I didn't just make it up. It's the propitiation of the Messiah. 
And Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah satisfied the Lord's wrath. This is the hardest part of all this to understand. The last three verses. Let's see if I can get there. It says, yet the Lord was pleased. After all that we've read, the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him arrested a guilt offering, he will see his seed and he will prolong his days. When you make Jesus that guilt offering, he'll raise him. He'll prolong his days. He'll say, no, I'll give you more. I'll give you that last 40-day stretch. Prolong his days before his ascension into eternity. Seated at the right hand of the majesty. the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see it out of his anguish and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion and he will receive the mighty as a spoil because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. We see that intercession um, when Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. The Messiah sacrificed himself for our salvation. God is, and and hear this, God is justly and righteously angry toward sin. God who is holy, God, God is love, and God is holy. He is perfect without blemish. There is, he is faithful, 100% faithful, complete. He is God with weight and depth behind it. God, and he is love. Because he's holy and that there's sin on this earth in all of us, he is angry at that sin John Stott uh, defines the wrath of God this way. The wrath of God is his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all its forms and manifestations. Everybody point at yourself. In our sin, we deserve his wrath. The propitiation, that word, means uh, the satisfying of God's wrath. And we see that it was because it says, uh, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. That's seeing the satisfaction of God's wrath, right? He will justify many in pouring out his wrath and he will gain the reward and exaltation following his crucifixion. I just want to talk to you a little bit more about what propitiation is and give you a little bit of a preface to it. God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. If it is God's wrath which needed to be propitiated, it is God's love which did the propitiating. God who is love still had wrath, justly, righteously, righteous anger towards sin. And God's love accomplished that in his son. John Stott continues, says, it is, it is God himself who in holy wrath needs to be propitiated. God himself who in holy love undertook to do the propitiating. And God himself who in the person of his son died for the propitiation of our sins. Thus, God took his own loving initiative to appease his own righteous anger by bearing it his own self in his own son when he took our place on the cross in that gruesome punishment for reconciliation to him. This last sentence is so many words, but bear with me. I'll explain them all. There is no crudity here to evoke our ridicule, only the profundity of holy love to evoke our worship. We should not be disgusted at the fact that God has wrath. We should not be confused or angry at him because he has wrath. He's righteous. Maybe we don't understand his ways. 
but we should surely shouldn't be angry at him for being angry at us. Yeah, have you ever? And, and look, I'm not a parent. Okay, I don't. I'm not. Not planning on it anytime soon. Okay, um, this might be why. Have you ever gotten in an argument with your kid, and you're angry at them for doing something wrong, and then they get angry at you for getting angry at them? How does that? So do we have any right to be angry at God, who is God? Absolutely not. This should not evoke our ridicule. What this should do with this propitiation, this satisfying of God's wrath, what this should do is evoke, if anything, our worship. God, I'm sinful. I have no way out of this radically corrupted, sinful body. But because you loved me, but because... You had love even for me and who I am or who I can't be on my own. You're holy and you're amazing. You're gracious, merciful. That's who God is. So I just want to, that's what propitiation is. I use the word because it works with all the rest of the words. It's got that shun thing. So, Um, you know, you got to, Got to make it catchy, but I, I, but I want I want y'all to understand that there's weight behind this. There's so much weight behind the resurrection, but what happened before it? So I, I want to point y'all back to the very first verse, the very first line of the very first verse. Who has believed what we have heard? This is hundreds, thousands of years ago that this was written, who was believed what we've heard. This is thousands of years ago. But we know that the Bible is inerrant and relevant and applicable to today in every way. So I want to ask y'all, who has believed what was written and what we've heard Luke twenty three forty six says, it talks about when Jesus took his last breath and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And why don't, why don't y'all stand? He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. We're not, we're not praying, but we're, we're gonna be sensitive to the spirit right now. How many of you can honestly say that you've ever said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit? God the Father commands us one work. One work. Someone asked Jesus, what is the work of the Father? And his response was, only belief. Who has believed what we have heard? Who will commit your spirit into the hands of the Father. It's better there. Can I tell you that it's better there? There's a promise that God keeps and that's eternal life. God is worthy of glory. If you haven't committed your spirit into the hands of the Father, if you haven't believed and you would like to, there's not necessarily a prayer that has to be said, just an action to be done and that is to believe. Um, but we're going to manifest that belief right now through a prayer. Um, and if so, if that's you, pray with me. Uh, Father, my spirit is tainted by sin. God, but you save and you provide and you heal. And God, I, I want to believe that you've done that for me. Believe that that is me who you healed on the cross that you gave life on the cross. God, I repent of all that I've done wrong against you. And I confess you now as Lord of my life. Nothing else will be my God from here on out. Only you, Father. And I'll live for you. In Jesus' name. I'll say amen in a second. And afterwards, you can come to me with 
questions about the message um, or to tell me that um, that was you who believed today. I would love to hear it. It's appropriate that we hear it. Um.